Hi, Sayan. Sain, can you hear me? Hello. Yes, yes, I can hear you. Okay, okay. Okay, now I'm keeping it silent. Okay, okay. We'll start at 8 p.m. sharp. How much is it, Sain? 8 p.m. 8 p.m., exactly. Okay. Okay, okay, yeah.
Hi, good evening to you all. Uh, we are back once again uh, with our series of lectures on media, medical physics. Today is class number 19. Last week, we had an excellent session on IMRT uh, from Professor Maria Das. And uh, today, moving forward, we'll be discussing stereotactic radiotherapy. I am Dr. Sayan Das, a radiation oncologist from Kolkata. And today, as our teacher, we have uh, Dr. Rahul Krishnatri. Uh, he is an associate professor uh, in Tata Memorial Center, Mumbai. He looks after neuro and euro oncology DNGs. Dr. Krishnatri did his junior residency from PGI Chandigarh, did his senior residency at Tata Memorial Hospital and is currently working there as a faculty. Uh, Dr. Krishnatri is now you, please. Hello. I request the participants to mute themselves, please. Uh, you can uh, mute all of them. Uh, ah, okay, fine. I'll, I'll do it. Ah, you can do that. Okay, so thank you, Sian, for your kind uh, introduction. I hope people are listening so that uh, <laughs> because they should be knowing that otherwise their things are blowing out. <laughs> but we usually have a good number of participants. Yeah, so I, think, I think most of the people are people know stereotactic radiotherapy. They're not interested. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, hello. But yeah, hello. No, 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 you can go ahead and start. Yeah. So I, I, I try to restrict myself to whatever is given in Perez, uh, Perez Khan, sorry, uh, as your textbook, uh, and uh, try to add a little bit uh, wherever I wanted to, but not too much beyond what is given in the textbook. Because I was told that uh, we, that's the basis of the classes, right, uh, Sayan? Is that okay? Yes, yes. Perfectly okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we are covering both the chapters, stereotype SRS and SRT. So just to begin with, uh, so it is the stereotactic radio surgery or stereotactic body radiotherapy actually comprises of two major components of the words and that is how you combine and make it meaningful, stereotactic as well as the radio surgery or uh, radiotherapy. So stereotactic means that you have an apparatus which actually tries to uh, you know, deliver accurately, beam delivery is accurate uh, using 3D imaging to localize a target as well as uh, the precision is very high, right? And then you try to give it the whole dose in a single fraction, then it is called as radio surgery because it's ablative. Or you give it in multiple fractions using some radiobiological hours, uh, basically again to reach the advantage of ablation or, you know, better radiobiological outcome. And you use multiple narrow beams, which may be coplanar or non-coplanar, isocentric, single isocenter or multiple isocentric. And that is how it combines together terms. So stereotaxy, which is trying to, in three-dimensional imaging, you try to uh, very precisely locate and target a uh, lesion. And very high dose, which is in single fraction, it is radio surgery. Multiple fractions, it is stereotactic radiotherapy. So what you see in the picture below, what I've shown you is a red thing is a target. So blue circle are the isocenter as well as the beam pen edge. So what you see is uh, on the right side uh, circle, it is single isocenter with the covering isodose of the uh, PTV or the CTV. Whereas the left side image is the irregular shape. So you can use multiple uh, beam circles with the multiple isocenters to cover the uh, volume. Okay. And again, uh, it can be delivered by a linear isolator solution or a gamma knife based solution. And it can be mono isocentric or multi isocentric. Okay. So yeah. this is what I mean to say when I say coplanar or non coplanar. So what you see on the left side of the image, there is a circle which is probably denoting the body or the center. So in one plane only, all the beams are coming into it. And that's a coplanar beam. Ideally, that is not supposed to be the case in the uh, SRS or SBRT, but nowadays with the much better technology with IMRT and rotational arc therapy, this is also okay to be done. 
what you see on the le uh, right side figure, it is basically showing two arcs. So one red arc and one white arc. And the beams in those arcs having uh, intersection. So they are not actually in the same plane. They are non-coplanar arc. So this, this was when earlier days, only that kind of arrangement was acceptable because people wanted to do only 3D CRT or just open fields of various collimation sizes. So in the beginning, only that was feasible to uh, do it. And it always, even today, if you do it with IMRT or other rotational techniques, it will achieve much better dose fall. So you want a very rapid dose fall beyond the tumor PTV edges, right? And that can be best achieved with non-coplanar arcs or non-coplanar beams. Is that okay? Or somebody has a doubt? So please stop me anywhere if you have doubt or you want more elaboration. Uh, so we usually have the questions at the end. So you no, can no, go that's on. okay. But I am okay with somebody wants to interrupt in between because you know revisiting the same thing might be difficult. So I, I don't want to say okay, you know, I get okay, stopped, okay. Uh, and I'll forget. So you can stop me. Huh? All the okay, residents, okay. please, please, free. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the next thing is about the accuracy of the beam delivery. So the stereotactic apparatus it comprises of imaging, 3D imaging target localization, immobilization, frequent setup, and the stringent quality assurance. So these are all components, you know, I have labeled them again from the Khan is because in exam, they will ask you this and you have to say it like that in the parrot form, right? You cannot miss any of these components uh, from the five components that are la labeled here, right? And these are the three classic solutions. So what you have is a gamma knife picture on the left, then uh, cyber knife, and then you have uh, Novalis or, uh, you know, from Varian and then Electra Synergy Versat is what you have for, for the Electra company. So the mechanical accuracy. So what is mechanical accuracy? One of the residents can, can you answer or try to answer? Or you want this didactic lecture? Sorry, sign. I'm trying to change a TMH protocol. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do that. You know, you, you know my itch. So somebody wants to... Uh, Answer what is the me mechanical accuracy, residents? Is the isocenter displacement from any uh, from the um, center from the target uh, center of the target image? So, somewhat you close, Jaita. So, uh, so mechanical isocenter is basically the isocenter or the center of all the mechanical movements where the machine happens. So, whether it is the couch rotation collimation rotation, gantry rotation. So all those things rotate around a single point, which is the mechanical isocenter, okay? Now there is a, a dosimetric or I, uh, dose isocenter, okay? So which is basically the dosimetric field isocenter, correct? So basically when you do stereotaxy or even IMRT or IGRT or 3 dcrt you in your quality assurance, you have to ensure that the field isocenter matches with the mechanical isocenter. You understood now? Is that clear or you want me to repeat it? Anybody? Shall we move ahead or I, you want me to repeat it? Yeah, I think you can move ahead. Yeah, okay. So, so what we want is that all the couch movement and everything, the mechanical accuracy of that ISO center should be less than a millimeter or uh, you know, ideally between 0.2 plus minus 0.1 millimeter, but maximum what is allowance is one millimeter error. Okay. So as I showed you in the picture, the various types is X-ray, uh, which is linear accelerator based, which may be your uh, cyber knife or Versa HD or your uh, Novalis in variant. Then it is gamma knife uh, because it has cobalt radio as a radioactive source for the radiation. And the same solutions can be used for SRT as well. So coming to your uh, X-ray knife or linear accelerator, they're again the same components. It's a little repetitive, but it's useful for you. Uh, multiple non-coplanar or coplanar arcs, dynamically shaped. So the MLCs move in and out of the field and they shape uh, to achieve the target conformity. IMRT, so intensity modulation can be done. And then rotational arcs. So when you will review the literature, when you will be much more into the clinics, you will see people coining new terms for stereotactic IMRT, stereotactic, uh, stereotactic 3D, 3DRT. So, you know, you should not get confused. So all those things are one thing only, basically what kind of technology you're using. 
so stereotactic radiotherapy is not limited by the planning or the delivery technique that you are using for the uh, radiotherapy which is whether it is 2d 3d uh, no sorry three dimensional uh, cdrt or cd crt or imrt or rotational arc therapy and you may coin new terms for that but doesn't matter the main issue is that you have to be stereotactic you have to be very precise with your target localization as well as your dose has to be very rapid dose fall out of the ptv and your high dose per fraction is what you have very severely hypofractionated dose you have to use so these three combined any way you plan it imrt cdcrt rotation arc doesn't matter okay so this is the important point as a junior resident i want to drive into your brains now the variables at your hand so how you try to achieve what all i said is by using beam blocks in the earlier olden days mlcs in today's era various beam arc angles you give different weightage to the arcs or the beams or you use intensity modulation uh, you may you change the dose rate which is not mentioned in your book but actually doable then one or more isocenters and then optimization of that or further refining of the target dose uh, distribution so how do we do stereotaxy so one important part which was historically there now we have moved away from the frame because of the technology on the couch uh, imaging is available but still this is very important still uh, which is frame so stereotactic frames are used which is basically uh, apparatus which is attachable to the patient's skull right so what you see here these are the uh, attachments to the skull and then you have the attachment to the couch below okay so that apparatus attaches the couch and to the skull uh, in a very rigid way and a fixed way and it has its own coordinates coordinates is x y and z right and as a radiation oncology resident you should know when i say what is coordinates right which relates to the center of the target which you want to reach out based on the imaging of the target that you have so that is what the job of the stereotactic frame is to to immobilize the patient with relation to the couch and the imaging of the target available with the coordinates so that you can precisely reach there so what you see in three pictures is leskel uh ratchet mudinger and todwell the brown robot we'll see in the next so what is more important you to understand is leskel is most commonly used in gamma knife centers the other ones are mainly neurosurgical procedures rarely used in radiotherapy procedures nowadays now this is brw frame uh which uh, at at least tata hospital we used to use it for avms but uh, it may be used for other brain meds and other things also even uh, with the help of the brain lab on the linear accelerator and leskel is generally used for uh, the gamma knife so what you see in this picture is this is one ring right uh, can you see my pointer or you can't see my pointer right? yes it's visible visible the pointer is visible no yeah yeah so <laughs> this is the frame and if you see these uh, knobs in the center so these are the screws basically which are fixed rigidly on the scalp right so they go up to the skull so you screw them inside uh, basically first you have to do, give the local anesthesia so this is a day care procedure you give a local anesthesia locally over there you give a small incision or a cut and then you basically apply these screws over there right so this is how uh, the this ring gets fixed to the skull now this ring is attached to the couch by this attachment over here in the down bottom now what you see here like a cage like circular cage like thing on the top of this ring is basically what is shown in the top figure over here which has rods like this you can see these rods right so these rods have a fixed coordinate system and as per the when you do the axial imaging for these patients you can have the fixed coordinate which will help to relocalize the target lesion in relation to these coordinates okay so this is what is used for normal ct or mri scanning same thing what you see on the right is for the angiographic frame which is <clears throat> so only the top part changes which has glass over here with the four embedded lead markers or fiducians so the accuracy of this whole system is basically 0.2 to 1 mm and even leskel also it is a similar matching right uh, basically 0.2 will be the reasonable thing to say about this frame both leskel and this because these are very uh, invasive and fixed uh, rigid kind of frames 
uh, it's basically on the system on which you use it. So if you use it on linear oscillator with the couch attachment, it the whole accuracy of the mechanical accuracy of the whole system with LA and this frame being attached there changes drops from 0.2 to one to one millimeter practically, right? Whereas in the gamma knife, which is the most accurate machine, uh, uh, it will be around 0.2 to 0.3 millimeters only. So it is much more accurate as compared to using BRW frames on the conventional linear oscillator. This is the same picture which I have just explained you on that circular ring, how it is attached to the patient and then where it is attached to the couch. So this is uh, the other type of frame which further modifications are used in these days clearing, but this is what is shown in your textbook as the Gil Thomas Cosman head ring. So in this, you do not go and screw onto the scalp. Rather, there is a uh, attachment which is <clears throat> flexi made as per the patient's scalp and it has a mouth bite. Uh, you see over here is a mouth bite. So it avoids the rotational error. So if you read literature about your orfit task, it's a major kind of a motion other than the longilateral is rotational error. So uh, this rotational error is basically what we try to control maximum by using these frames or uh, uh, localization devices. And that is basically done, achieved by your mouth bite. So mouth bite is a very important component of all these uh, non-invasive frames, whichever we use these days more commonly with many, there are several solutions. We are not given in your textbook, but there are several uh, by from various uh, commercial uh, ven uh, vendors. So next component comes is about after the frame uh, is the isocentric accuracy. So how do you maintain the linear oscillator mechanical isocenter, which we just discussed uh, before uh, ahead, right? So it is the alignment of the stereotactic frame coordinates with the isocenter of the machine, right? The mechanical isocenter of the machine. And then the me mechanical isocenter, as well as the radiation isocenter, which is basically the field isocenter, it should remain all in radius of one millimeter. So the total error of the whole, uh, you know, setup cannot be more than a millimeter. And you can find more details about these, uh, how to do the accuracy tests and all in AAP and the report 54 and 40. But what's given in your textbook is from in chapter number 17. And I copied those things over here for you so that they remain at one place for you. Uh, I hope that 17 chapter must have already been covered as quality assurance, but it's just a revision. What I want to show you is in general, what you, this is for the annual check for IMRT and all you will accept two millimeter of con O incidence of radiation and mechanical isocenter. So I just explained that in the beginning, what is the difference between the two? And in SPRT, you would like to have it less than one millimeter. Okay. The rest all remain similar. Then for the monthly quality assurance, what you want is couch position indicators. Again, has to be within one millimeter and 0.5 degree uh, variation. Uh, for again, localizing laser also less than one millimeter. Again, for daily or on the day of treatment, laser localization, one millimeter. Distance indicator, ODI. You know ODI? All of you know ODI? Have you all seen ODI on your machines? Yes, sir. Yes, everybody knows ODI? Okay. So yes, then there's a polymeter size indicator. So polymeter size also should be in concurrence of within a millimeter accuracy. So all these accuracy tests have to be done and especially on the day of the treatment, okay? So the next comes the frame verification or device accuracy. Uh, for that, you have a phantom. So every frame has its own custom made uh, phantom, uh, which helps to identify the coordinates of the phantom uh, of the frame uh, with the mechanical isocenter of the machine. So you need to match that as well as match the radiation field uh, isocenter with the frame isocenter or the target isocenter which you will achieve with the planning system. So uh, I don't want to get into the nitty gritty but this is the phantom for your BMW frame and this knob is where you will replace it with the tungsten ball and you will irradiate and you will see that the accuracy of these uh, targets at 8 to 9 polymation angles is in the alignment of 0.1 millimeter. So which will check together the frame uh, accuracy as well as your mechanical isocentry of the uh, uh, I, 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 mechanical accuracy of the isocenter of the machine and the radiation field. So all three will be ca calculated together in this test, which uh, should be within one 
uh, less than 0.1 millimeter accuracy. That is what they want to achieve, but one is acceptable overall, right? So this is what I have just explained. And then we, we move on to the beam collimation. So nowadays we don't use it, but still from, from the historical importance point of view, because a lot of your examiners maybe from that era may like to ask this question. So uh, you know the structure of linear oscillator. You have a primary collimator, which is in the, just at the head. And below that, there are the secondary collimator before, below the flattening filter in the LA gantry head. Below that, you can have a secondary attachment for doing stereotactic treatment, which is roughly 15 centimeters long circular cones of different aperture sizes. So they will help you to have a lesser penumbra. You want a sharper beam for SRS so that there's a more rapid dose fall off. And that's why you try to minimize the penumbra by having these cones, additional cones over there. Nowadays, we don't use it because one, we have already high definition micro MLC, especially in Novalis and Versa HD. And the second thing is basically uh, you have a lot of uh, technology to uh, you know, modulate the beam and the dose fall from the rotational arcs or multiple arcs or non coplanar arcs, uh, variable output and other variables are so many very other variables are there that actually practically doesn't me make sense to do this. And this adds, so anything add, you add to a radio survey process adds its own error. So this can also have its own errors. So it's better not to have an additional attachment there if you can achieve the similar kind of uh, uh, effect from the other technology that you all have in the current day and era. So these are the certain ones which we were used in past. So they can be used in your off key for certain exams. That's why I have put it as the pictures. So these are not given in your uh, Khan, but uh, otherwise you should know from the department point of view. So these are the, some kind of, this is one of the cones. This is uh, like uh, micro MLC uh, high definition from brain lab, which was, uh, which is generally attached to the head of the gantry. Okay, so these are the different various machines. So I've just kept it for your knowledge uh, and awareness comparison. So uh, this is not again in your Khan and some of this data is inaccurate. So that's why I just read it out with you so that we can correct the data what is given in this slide. So immobilization, so CyberKnife is generally frameless, right? It, can, it has a multi-plan treatment uh, planning system. You can do SRS, SRT, everything. But you cannot do conventional IMRT or conventional 3D CRT uh, uh, of large field areas. Like you cannot read the whole abdomen and conventional fraction. That is not something what is the purpose of this machine, right? Whereas uh, whether it is Novalis or Versa HD, they can be used for the regular treatment as well. So they are much more economical in when you have a setup where you have much more power routine patients and one or two uh, occasional SRS or SBRT patients only, right? Then uh, for the setup localization, CyberKnife has 2D KV orthogonal X-rays and it, uh, it is much more than what is written here. So it, it can track the tumor motion uh, and actually, you know, uh, deliver the dose accordingly, uh, tracking that whenever tumor comes in the location where it needs to hit or target, and then only it hits. So that is one of the beautiful things about cyber knife, which is not available in any of the other linear oscillator, whether it is a variant Novalis or the Versa HD, right? Then a 6 MV is what you actually use. So 10 or 20 MV in Novalis is useless for SRS or SPRT. We generally do not use those energies. Why? Because 6 MV has the smallest penumbra, right? So you want sharper dose uh, for. Okay. Then coming to the treatment delivery. So uh, there's some limitation on the posterior as beams of the cyber knife. Uh, I'm not sure about this. People who have CyberKnife can verify whether that statement is correct or not. Uh, I thought that CyberKnife has much more flexibility in delivery, but uh, if somebody has a CyberKnife experience, may speak up. Uh, though interfraction motion is much better picked up in CyberKnife because it can track it and deliver it accordingly. Optical tracking and other things are also there in coordination with the orthogonal x-rays which are continuous so that's why the treatment delivery time is longer but it's much more accurate uh, and much more uh, you know uh, continuous process of tracking as compared to any other linear oscillator that we have uh, then looking at the other platform so it is something similar to that slide what we have it's much more diverse comparison of novalis uh, electa uh, versa ht and only thing i found wrong in this for i think you will get all these slides so i'm not reading out everything only thing is 6D couch is available on the Varian and the Electa 
thing and you can have intermittent or interrupted treatment in electa as well right so even you can uh, interrupt the cbct so suppose a patient is going through a gating procedure uh, so if you want to do a gated cbct the current technology does allow you to interrupt the cbct and stitch it together uh, to come back in deep breath hold or deep breath uh, you know breath hold or breath inhale or exhale hold also it can interrupt the treatment according to your breath hold so both electa and variant can have that facility so it's not that it's not there okay so tomo uh, still it is uh, it has to work harder on getting it better to that uh, but planning system is very wonderful now coming a few words on the gamma knife so gamma knife delivers simultaneous radiation with large number of isocentric gamma rays which is basically from cobalt 60 and it is placed like a hemisphere orientation around the head uh, it's collimated uh, the sources are contained in a heavily shielded central body with shielded entrance door a uh, recent model of gamma knife is called as perfection right what you see here is a couch on which the patient lies down uh, here is the patient's head and what you see around here is the lensical frame which is fixed rigidly to the head and this frame in turn gets fixed to the couch fixator right so the whole assembly of the head the frame and the couch fixator are put, become one assembly so the ac mechanical accuracy of this system becomes very much robust as compared to your linear oscillator in which an add on everything is fixed right and what another thing is that this couch uh, you know uh, just goes inside so the machine actual machine treatment machine or the cobalt sources are inside this so the shutter opens up like a fulja simpson and the couch moves in once you want to put the patient inside for the treatment right otherwise this uh, shutter remains closed and this is uh, a shielding thing so what you see here like once the patient is inside you can see the whole system is rigidly attached to the couch and the mechanical accuracy of the couch movement and the attachment of the frame is within less than 0.1 to 0.2 mm and what you see here is basically uh, this this is the shielding thing uh, collimator beams collimator which open up and close as per the plan and above this are the 192 cobalt 60 sources 192 is the number of sources and cobalt 60 is the source that you have right so these all sources converge at a isocenter and this couch can be rotated and moved around according to the isocenter requirement right and there are eight movable sectors in which you can have them and the collimator size is what the way the aperture can open for each source is 4 mm 8 mm 16 mm diameter so practically what i showed you in the first slide of multiple isocenters this is how the cobalt Uh, isocenters would be, and these are individual circles are called as shots, right? So one shot, second shot, third shot, fourth shot, fifth shot, and these are the isocenters of each shot. And when these isocenters overlap with each other, there will be a very high dose in those regions, and you know there will be some low dose. So it is a heterogeneous dose distribution as compared to normally what you read in radiotherapy is a homogeneous dose distribution. So in SRS we try to achieve heterogeneous. those are shown or it is that is acceptable so don't get scared with that when your physicist show you such a plan okay okay so what is the significant is there any difference between gamma knife and x ray knife no there are two style names because of the kind of the beam that you're using uh, there is little difference in the accuracy physical accuracy what we just spoke about but clinically finally in the outcomes no significant clinical difference if you're treating the same dose same kind of lesion uh, gamma knife is the and the flexibility of the machine so just like cyber knife gamma knife even more restricted that it can only treat the brain lesion it cannot treat the rest of the body uh, at least cyber knife can do srs or sbrt to the other sides of the body but you cannot use it for other kind of treatments of radiotherapy that you would like to do uh, it has an advantage that it can treat multiple isocenters and targets it is much more preferred for the simplicity of the setup and easy doing and it's very convenient and much more reliable to do functional radio uh, surgery will come to that right so because in that the dose uh, used per fraction or single fraction is very very high so 80 gray to 120 gray single fraction is used in certain functional radio surgeries now coming to the dose calculation algorithms approximately spherical geometry of human head and the homogeneity of the tissue actually helps in the dose calculation so there's no not too much of heterogeneity correction as the bone right 
two millimeter rigid spacing proce produces a those are certainty of around one to two percent compared to three to four percent when you have a larger grid. So you understand what is the grid. So you divide the whole area where you want to calculate into a grid, right? So if that grid size of calculating those is less than uh, two millimeters, then the accuracy is one to two percent. But if it is four millimeters or more, then you go haywire with your accuracy, and that's not acceptable in stereotactic paper. Then CT and MR both are used for planning, and usually the slice thickness should be uh, between three to ten millimeter, ideally around two millimeters. And uh, uh, CT is primary imaging where you plan, and MR can be used to uh, give you target information for delineation. Uh, but it's, the accuracy of MR is usually less because it has much more image distortion, and that is why uh, you know CT is preferred imaging for planning. Uh, the target definition is around one to three millimeter slice uh, thickness is used, and critical structures and lesions have to be drawn in close vicinity. So around at least ten centimeter up and down around the lesion should be all the target lesion, whichever uh, critical uh, organs that you want to spare should be pointed. So quality assurance, uh, we just spoke about all the parameters of the mechanical, and then you have to do for the stereotactic frame also that uh, we saw the exposure x x ray for the frame. So all those things have to be done on each day for each fraction for prior to the treatment. Uh, it has to be checked, right? And uh, it's very critical. You cannot uh, do a falter with the dose delivery. So it, it has to be done. You have to have that program in place before you do stereotactic RT. Coming to clinical uh, applications, so cranial radio surgery is generally benign tumors like AVMs, meningiomas, like acoustic neuromas, malignant lesions, sometimes as gliomas. Actually, uh, there can be a big controversy, but yes, glioma people do it, so I will not omit it. Uh, brain metastasis is very commonly used. Functional disorders like trigeminal neuralgia, movement disorders. Then there is a functional uh, fractional uh, SRT when the tumor is in close proximity to brainstem or optic chiasm, uh, especially like pituitary adenomas. Then radiobiologically, it causes thrombosis in AVM and reproductive uh, cell death in other tumors. So these are the few examples which are given in Khan. Uh, if you want, we can come back to them during discussion. If you have a query or you want to discuss these figures in detail. Uh, I don't think there's something specific that I would like to talk about. Coming to extracranial radio surgery, so you treat uh, small localized tumors extracranially. Techniques are generally frameless, so you don't have invasive frames that we just spoke about in the brain uh, stereotaxy. Tumor is localized through image guidance, such as extract or cyber knife, or even phone beam CT is generally very commonly used. Right, so we'll come to that in detail in SBRT section of the talk today. Right, so X-ray uh, imaging of bones and implanted fibrillation markers are used to localize the target and track its motion. And generally, the sites are spine, lung, liver, pancreas, kidney, and prostate. So the key points from this chapter is intracranial SRS or SRT technique involves stereotactic apparatus to immobilize the head and fix it to the couch and the mechanical isocenter of your machine. And the delivery of radiation through multiple non coplanar beams and arcs. So, for your exam purpose, it remains multiple non coplanar beams and arcs. Right? And overall accuracy of plus minus one millimeter in coverage of the intended target volume is the commonly accepted standard for SRS and SRT procedures. Dosimetry of small fields is very uh, tough topic to touch with junior residents. Even physicists are very confused, but still. Two words. What is written here is what you can remember. It's complex because of the possible lack of charge particle equilibrium. If you want, we can discuss in the discussion later on. The detector must be of sufficient small size so as not to perturb the elect electron fluence. Again, we can touch that if you want to. Any energy dependence must also be accounted for. Now, SRS requires careful commissioning and rigorous quality assurance procedures that we talked about. Then extracranial SRS and stereotactic body radiation therapy produce uh, procedures are frameless and rely on robotic image image guided radiation therapy techniques such as extract or cyber knife. Now coming to SRT, that is the next chapter, chapter number 20, 20 I suppose, yes. 
So stereotactic radiotherapy procedures uh, for treating extracranial tumors. Uh, and basically it is ultra high dose per fractions, six to 30 gray and four to uh, up to five or fewer fractions. And basically the same example, we just spoke about spine, lung, liver, pancreas, kidney, and prostate. And uh, how you differentiate between 3D CRT and IMRT conventionally that you use versus SBRT is basically unconventional dose fractions, so six gray per fraction, five fractions only, applicable to only well circumscribed tumors with near no or no CTV. This is a dynamic concept still, but practically for theoretical aspect in exam, no CTV, okay? So maximum cross-sectional diameter of about five centimeter or less. Again, theoretical concept, you should remember this. Practically applicable, but can be stretched, right? Small or no margins for beam penumbra, stringent need for patient immobilization and respiratory motion management. Don't try to break these rules, okay? Otherwise you or the patient will suffer. Higher frequency of patient monitoring and geometric verification through image guidance, and then SBRT training for the treating staff. These are the various references for the radiobiology, how SR, SRS or SBRT uh, works, uh, how it is different from your conventional RT. If you want, we can have a short brief discussion in the end if we have time, but I would really encourage you to read these papers. Uh, they are very nicely written things, right? These are all references from your Khan only. You can go back <clears throat> and read those references from there. Okay. So let us come to the components, how you do or plan SRT. So there are multiple components to the same. Uh, so three components, most important one are basically sufficient patient immobilization, management or control of the tumor motion and anatomical 3D anatomical imaging data, right? So coming to the immobilization, stereotactic body frames uh, are used. So just so 3D image verification tools, when were not present, these frames were much more commonly used. But now when you have 3D body imaging with like 3D C, uh, like CVCT and or MVCT, uh, these frames can be, you know, uh, taken off. You don't need that rigid frames to be used routinely. So most commonly used one is body fix. Ideally, they should have lighter in weight, constructed of low density material because you don't want uh, to something to interfere from the posterior beams. Uh, typically use vacuum cushions to conform and immobilize the patient body in the same position and reproduce it. And you need a localization apparatus attached to the body frame or the couch to provide a reference of coordinates for the couch to the patient to the uh, frame. So we'll show you in the next picture. Uh, it may include the abdominal compression devices like man manual compression paddle or pneumatic compression belt. We'll show you that also. Uh, and induce which what is the purpose of that uh, compression device it induces the shallow breathing so that it minimizes the respiratory motion what you see here is a stereotactic body frame so this is the frame on which the patient will lie down there's a vacuum cushion box over here which will shape and conform according to the patient and if you see these calipers they will have these these lines are basically to match to the laser uh, in room laser so one laser is here it is a horizontal uh, horizontal laser, this is vertical laser, the lateral laser, and there's a vertical laser marking in the center of the frame. And then this is the abdominal compression, uh, which will actually go and to uh, compress the chest uh, from the anterior part, right? So that you don't breathe very deep. Uh, so you will have a shallow breathing, very little movement, which is necessary to lie down at that time, right? So that the motion of the lung tumors or abdominal tumors or breast tumors are minimized. So next is coming to control the tumor motion. So you can do it actively or passively. So this is something as passive uh, motion management. So you manage passively that like you allow the patient to breathe in its own regular rhythm and you accommodate your planning or contouring other things according to that while monitoring that motion, right? So what is being done is there's a R marker over the body, chest wall, which is just kept at the lower border of the sternum. And this is monitored by the RF camera. Now, this creates a wave-like pattern of the movement with the breathing cycle, right? And you take CT scan at dividing the whole breathing cycle into 10 parts, and you have 10 CT uh, bins with that. And you take a composite picture from combining all those CTs to the target, which is called as your maximum index in intensity projection, right? So 
whatever is intensity from 0 to 100 uh, motion of the whole respiratory cycle, right? And that defines your ITV, so internal target motion uh, volume, so which encompasses the GTV as well as motion in all around the normal breathing cycle, right? So that whole volume becomes your ITV and above that you give the PTV, which is for the setup error, okay? So this is how you passively manage. So you're not changing the breathing other than you make the patient breathe regularly and rhythmic way rather than having an abrupt breathing. Uh, and you're accommodating the whole motion of the uh, tumor into as a one volume and treating that as a whole. So wherever the tumor in that range is, it is always being treated. Now, uh, next is about the active motion management, which is trying to reduce the amount of the tumor motion. So you do the abdominal compression in this. That is what you see on the frame also. So this is the end, uh, end on view of that. So what you see is you're compressing the abdomen or you compress just at the sternum level so that breathing is dampened. So you don't breathe too heavily. Uh, other devices which can be used is breath, breath hold or breath control devices. So this is like a mouthpiece where from which you are breathing and it's showing you the volume of breath going in and out. So that way patient is more able to actively control his depth of breathing and rhythm of the breathing. So he can see that breathing pattern and control it because you train it accordingly. Uh, what here the patient directly looks at the screen or the monitor which shows him the you know, breathing pattern which again display, display is displayed at the uh, tre uh, treatment console also and you can also have a look so both you and the patient are simultaneously observing the breathing pattern and manipulating it as you want it right uh, over here the patient has a goggle so basically goggle shows the same thing so these things are not there in your khan but now are coming up that's why I put up and just to show you right so what is important to understand is basically these uh, all these techniques needs a lot of patients involvement, education, training and reciprocation. So if the patient is non-compliant or you or cannot understand or follow advice or have a poor lung compliance to follow these things, then they are not suitable for these active measures. Uh, in passive measures, what you saw, the patient involvement is the least. So if you are <coughs> okay with whatever you're doing, then you are fine. You don't need to push it through. So that's much more active, uh, easy to implement as compared to these ones. Uh, then coming the imaging. So 3D imaging. So that's important for clear visualization. Same as SRS, what we spoke. So only thing is that you may use CT, MR and PET. PET is hardly used in brain tumors, but uh, much more commonly used in lung and other cancer when you're doing stereotactic radiotherapy. So CT is the primary imaging as we spoke before. MR and PET are basically the complementary information which you add on to the primary image to give you much more uh, tumor information so that you can be much more accurate with your target delineation. Okay, so contouring and dose reporting. So your uh, Khans is uh, older ICRUs, but 83 ICRU is there, which I think is much more relevant in today's time and have some additional uh, information. So they don't go into the detail of ICRU 83. So I'm not touching here 60 and other things also they have not touched. So I just encourage you to go back and read ICRU 83. It's a good document to read and understand. Uh, what I want you to understand other than that is lateral electron scattering is reduced. So you use 6MV, least penumbra, heterogeneity correction also is important in dose calculation. So all the more modern dose calculating systems that you have for any of the linear letters have all those things. So these were critical in earlier eras when they, there was some heterogeneity in availability of uh, TPS or treatment planning systems, which were calculating doses. So nowadays you have, uh, most of the centers will have good uh, things which will have heterogeneity correction and all those Monte Carlo system. So I think those things are mentioned. So you should know them as for documentation or theoretical exam. But practically, once you know from your physicist, you should be assured. And uh, Dose prescription is generally around 80 to 90 percent iso dose prescription, unlike what you have in your conventional CCRT and IMRT. But this is what is given in your Khan. So, uh, but if you read literature for SRS or SBRT prescriptions, it can be very, very heterogeneous from one center to the other. So, even when you read literature, you have to be very careful how the authors have described their dose prescription methodology. And that's why the ICRE reporting 83 is very important to read and understand. So these are some uh, prescriptions from Astro uh, for basically 
uh, how a SPRT program, a new program or a new disease site for SPRT should be uh, started and uh, how frequently you should do QAs or meetings and uh, other quality checks to be sure that you're doing the things rightly and uh, you know, you're not putting any patient at risk or harm. So the documentation, the quality assurance, uh, clinical or trial or what is the real thing to be done or not to be done, all those things have been listed in this table. I'm not going into detail, so you can go through that later. So coming to the key points so that we have some time for discussion, I'm just skipping through this. You can just read them. There's nothing special. So SPRT is an external beam radiotherapy method used to deliver ultra high dose to uh, RT to the extracranial target. The SPRT delivers, uh, delivery uses body frames. We saw them. Independent coordinate system to immobilize the patient and largely placed, replaced with more conventional immobilization combined with pre-treatment IGRT position verification. Then tumor motion, uh, especially in the lung or the abdominal tumors, is accounted for using 4D CT scans. And 4D CT scanning produces a set of images. That is what we spoke about the passive breathing. So MIP images and the target motion can be physically also reduced by abdominal compression or breath hold. And you can combine active passive both measures also. There's no problem, right? So those calculation for SBRT in lung should be done on the TPS, capable of determining those near the lung tissue interface. Three, uh, three dimensional algorithms such as uh, convolution superimposition or Monte Carlo are recommended, which are the most modern systems uh, have it, right? So there's no issue with that as well. Uh, then is the biological effects of SBRT dose fractions are very high, ranging to about price, uh, twice that of the conventional fractionation schemes. And recommended quality assurance tolerances for SBRT are tighter than for the conventional radiation treatment. And APM report is 142. So now this is the small exercise that I want the participants to do, right? So we have 50 at least uh, participants, right? So can we do a simple BD calculation uh, for 24 gray single fraction SRS, 12 gray into five. So 12 into five is 60 gray, right? And then there is a SBRT 20 gray in three, uh, for three fractions, which is again 60 gray delivered in three fractions. So can we have BED alpha by beta two and 10 from people? Yeah. So those answering, you can write the answers in the chat box. Yeah. So we can have five, uh, three minutes for that, I think. Don't uh, use your phones huh, for that calculation, please. <laughs> Sign, will you keep the time for it or you want me to keep time? No, no, no. I will do it. I'll be just back in a second. Then.
Okay, so we have few answers. I think some of them are correct. Some of them are not. Devanjan. So what is 26.4? Okay, so I'll just show you how it is for at least last two fractionation from thing. So what you see is one, uh, when, when you give 12 gray per fraction into five, your BD 10 is 132. Right. And uh, same when you use 20 in three fraction, it becomes 180 grade 10. Right. Similarly, when you want to calculate alpha by beta 2 or normal tissue tolerance. Right. So somebody sticked marked the FM Khan. Huh? Very good. <laughs> and you have done or somebody else has done it? <laughs> no, I did. <laughs> you did. Okay. So it becomes 110 for 12 into five fractions and uh, 12, 12 into five fractions and 150 gray for your 20 into three fractions, right? So I think some of you have got some things correct, but uh, other things wrong, right? So you should check how you are doing your calculations and you do it for the single fraction also at home. So let us come to now questions so that we have time for everything. So uh, sign, should we take the questions from chat? Yeah. 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 So uh, I request the participants. So Please write down your questions on the chat box while we get them answered. So I think the first question was, please explain regarding planar and non-coplanar beams. Yeah. Okay. So we'll go back to that. So you understand what is one plane? Anyway, so I'll try. So yeah. Yes. So can you see this, uh, my cursor, can you see the circle and the multiple arrows coming towards it? Yes. 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 Okay. So this red circle is one plane. So basically if this is my head, right? You want to take something into my head. This is one plane, right? So the, if all the beams are in one plane, it is co-planar, right? So what I'm trying to show you is one plane by the circle and there are beams coming from various angles into that circle. So if all the beams are coming from various direction here, this is one plane, right? So these are coplanar, right? And non-coplanar is when the beams are coming in different planes. So this is one plane, five, six beams are here. Then one beam is, one plane is like this, right? Can you see me? Can you all see my picture? Madhu? Yes. Yes, yes sir. Yes, sir. So, yeah, so this is one plane. This is one plane. So there are four or five beams coming like this. Then one one is like this. One plane is like this. So axial, coronal, sag. You understand that, right? So there can be at least five to ten degrees between eight degrees. What is between the various planes? And you can have multiple beams going through them. So that is how you achieve much more degree of freedom to reach the target, right? And that way you can achieve much better. Uh, rapid do dose fall, which is uh, how you try to spare, uh, you know, normal tissue. So if I just explain you, right? So if you're giving a target dose of 24 gray in a single sitting, right? If you're using 24 beams, right? Uh, what will be your exit dose per beam? All beams are equal. Roughly one gray. Right, so you will distribute your 24 gray in all beams equally, right? So there are one gray each, so 24 gray clay. You will have one gray exit dose probably, right? Correct, eh? Enough. So if you are placing all of them in one arc like this, right? One plane only. So there is a high chance that one beam will have a opposite parallel opposite with each other, right? Or they will have a larger overlap with each other. Right? So there'll be a lot of areas where which will get two gray also over the overlap or three gray when there are three beams having very close by entry exit. Okay. So if you try to use multiple planes or non-coplanar beams, so one plane may have six, another plane may have six, 
another plane may have six. So the kind of overlap between the beams or of their penumbra or their exit or entry doses, it's very less. So your actually you will be just spreading out one gray around and very little area will be having a uh, overlapping area of the dose. So you have a you will have a very rapid dose fall from your target to the normal tissue. Samaj mein aapko pura concept? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. So the next question is, what are the doses commonly used for SRS? What? So it depends on the target thing. So, you know, acoustic shonoma generally 12 gray is used. Meningioma 12 to 18 gray can be used. Uh, then your, uh, this thing in the uh, functional things like trigeminal neuralgia, 80 gray uh, single fraction is used, right? And it's just on the trigeminal nerve uh, root, okay? And then uh, for uh, your intentional tremors or thalamotomies, uh, again, a functional disorder, you have to use it around 100 gray. Uh, AVMs is 15, 12 to 15 gray, depending on the location, size, and all those things. So these are so various uh, indications, various locations you use, different dose fractionation, right? And there is some evidence based on which you do it, either for the toxicity or for the efficacy. Uh, again, for your body SBRT, uh, you have different dose fractionation. So for, for prostate, 35 to 30, even 42 gray now people use. So 35 to 42 gray in five fractions is what is used for the prostate. Uh, for your lung, the, the two fractionation schedules that I gave you are basically for the lung, which I gave you for calculation. Then uh, your kidney is 45 in three most commonly, but you try to achieve somewhere near about. Liver is 35 in five. To 45 and 5. So there are various dose fractionation schedules used for SRS and SPRTs. These are the common ones which you asked for. Uh, the next one is Is there a risk of electron contamination in case of your BRW frames or non invasive head rings? So your beam angles are placed in such a way that you don't go through the metal part of the uh, frame. So Okay, okay. Just before that, I must tell you that I think there is a confusion here. So these localizers, right? Uh, you know, it's a cage, just a pinjar, just a circle for the crayon. You are detachable. Hota hai. Uh, this is only for localization and matching. Once you're treating the patient, the, the, this frame is not there on the top, only this ring remains. Understood? So, and you see the level of the ring, level of the ring is at the nose. Okay. So your tumor will be in the brain somewhere here, correct? So you have to only avoid the entry and exit through these knobs, right? Otherwise, this all the pinjara is not there. So there's no chance of electron contamination from here. Abhay, is that clear to you and others also? Is that part of the question clear? So your electron contamination will not happen from these things because this this is a fixture just for in, while imaging as well as for matching later on. Once that is done, you remove it and then only treat it. So there will be no beams passing through these. This will be out. So what will remain on the patient is this thing. Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. so the rest of the part uh, question is with the increase in the beam energy, the lateral photon as well as the electron scatter is reduced. How is it that penumbra is smaller in the 6 MV as compared to the 10 MV in the SBRT. No, no. So penumbra is not uh, the electron scatter in the penumbra is not reduced by increasing the energy. Do check it again. Okay. So yeah, the beams are not sharper by increasing the energy. Okay. So can you shall we move ahead? Sai? Yes. 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 So, the next one is an important question discussed yeah. regarding the prescription i suppose and where do you prescribe and how do you prescribe so gamma knife is important so i should go back to my first figure so thankfully whatever i made in the last moment is useful here. so so just <laughs> you can see here can you see this diagram and my uh, cursor the irregular target with multiple circles right yes so this is an irregular geometry target which we are trying to treat suppose this is a meningioma in the brain right what you see in that the circular these are shots so if you imagine whatever the short sizes or the collimation sizes in gamma knife I told you is 4 millimeter, 8 millimeter and 16 millimeter. 
right? So suppose this is four millimeter, this is eight, this is eight. These are sixteen millimeter shots. Now, what you see is that these shots have a huge area of overlap with each other. Now, suppose you are prescribing twelve gray to this target volume. So that means that twelve gray is going to cover the whole target all around. Most of it, ninety percent of the target volume is going to be covered by twelve gray at least, right? So in that, this edge may not get twelve gray. Totally, it might get 11.5 or 11.9, but majority of 90% of the target will get 12 gray or higher. Okay, so what will happen over here if this shot is 12 gray and this shot is 12 gray? Here it will be for 28 gray. Correct? This overlapping area, है ना? This area also will be 28 gray. This will be also 28 gray. So. 28 gray, so that is why you prescribe to 50% iso dose. So you are getting 28, uh, 12, 24 gray. Sorry, I'm sorry. Huh? So <laughs> 24 gray is what is you are getting in general, but actually you are prescribing to whole is 50% iso dose of the total dose region, which is 12 gray. So this is how you change your uh, the way you prescribe there in gamma light. Is that clear, Trishta? so the way you are planning and delivering is very different in gamma night in la it is similar to imrt uh, what rapid arc or whatever you are usually doing so the system itself achieves achieves that yes, so there is one more question uh, in case of gamma night isn't there risk of radiation leakage are baba utna hota to fir koi karta hi kyun hai na so this machine is used for last 100 years and so there is no leakage the uh, you use cobalt 60 otherwise also no theratrons are there babatron is there so there is no leakage ha huh? abhay so all very well shielded and everything is very well taken care of normal whatever risk exposure is there with the uh, radioactive material use is there but Uh, all those norms are respected whatever is uh, uh, international or uh, national body regulations are there okay so there is no such things what you are talking about and the source doesn't come out and go out it's a collimator collimator which uh, has the blocks come uh, open and shut right? so there is no leakage from that other than what you would normally expect and it is already leveraged into the system okay so this Uh, Tishita is asking for SRS and SBRT. The pres prescription isodose is not uniform. It may vary from 50 to 90 percent. Yes, it can vary from 50 to 190 percent. And inside the target, uh, the dose can go up to 130, 150, 240 150 percent also. So the conventional 95 to 100 percent, 107 percent coverage is not a routine thing in SBRT. Okay. Okay, so we are on time. I think any more questions? I don't think so. Anyone else having any questions? Uh, no. Okay, great. So, I think that's all for today. Uh, okay, so there's one more from Abhay. Okay. i could not understand the aspect regarding the detector and electron fluence so where was that uh, can you tell me the which slide it was i don't remember so just stop me wherever you want me to stop uh, abhay switch on your mic if you need to where was that uh, thing that you're asking sir yes abhay aage hai kya hello hello yeah abhay i can hear you My key points of S. Okay. 
अबे दिस इज वॉट यू आर आस्किंग नो द इलेक्ट्रॉन पार्टिकल इन इक्विलिब्रियम एज वेल एज द इलेक्ट्रॉन फ्लूएंस थिंग Yes, I think so. But I have. Yeah, so I'm just trying to give you a little uh, better answer. So, yeah, so it's a very complex topic because you know the conventional uh, uh, dosimetry is based on or your field size is around four centimeter, and now in SRS or SRT we are treating the targets which are in millimeters or sometimes uh, you know or just a small centimeter, one or two, and when you're doing intensity modulation in such small fields. to and with with very severe dose gradients right so you are reaching somewhere 24 gray in the center and within a centimeter you are 12 gray prescription and then you want a rapid dose fall to 2 gray by within a centimeter so it's a very rapid dose fall and change so it's a very complex uh, dose distribution which is already happening there which system is showing you but you need to verify by quality assurance so dosimetrically to verify that and measure that is a big challenge So what you saying here is detector surface size. So your once you you for any quality assurance QA or Q uh, for a uh, IMRT or any other thing if you know for SBRT to do that or SRS to do that your part uh, that detector surface which is going to detect the dose has to be so so tiny you know so that uh, that dose gradient doesn't affect its accuracy you know so if your dose range is Changing hundred time, hundred percent, you know, within a few millimeters from twenty-four gray, it is going to twelve gray from the center to the edge of a target, which is less than a centimeter, right? So, if your target uh, detector, which you're keeping in that area, it has to be accurately placed wherever you're calculating, right? And it has to calculate even in that same grid size where you are estimating the dose in the planning system. So that is very difficult to achieve. <clears throat> okay, and the second thing is. that to achieve that electron fluence or the equilibrium so it's uh, a dose at a point is not just direct dose deposition right it's a combination of the primary photon and the electron uh, secondary electron and all those things right so that thing also to achieve in a phantom or a detector surface is very difficult so in that process the whole dosimetry of small fields for srs and srt is very challenging to you know estimate also and accurately verify also right so the flexibility is much more in estimating and uh, matching as compared to what it is in conventional imrt where you have a 1 cm range uh, of the constant dose in your plan and you uh, with you know no heterogeneity around for 5 cm or 3 cm and plus minus 5% variation is acceptable for conventional imrt it's very 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 different for srs and srt so this is what uh, this completely uh you know completes the picture for you what i want you to get rather in, than into the complexity of how it is done and what all there is some paragraphs given in khan i didn't purposefully keep it here because it will confuse you and they don't give you complete information so that is why i kept it only for this paragraph but i have elaborated what actually you need to know from this topic if you have more doubts you can ask So do we have any more questions? I think we are good, ready for good night. <laughs> yes, I think so. <laughs> so thank you, uh, Dr. Rahul. It was an excellent uh, uh, discussion, and I mean, very well explained most of those uh, those finer. nuances so thanks a lot thank you both the science science square and uh, you know somehow now when you were saying all this no i remembered how 
you would present and i would uh, be in the audience and <laughs> ask question and now it is reverse hello good thank you very much have a good night yeah good night to you all we meet again next week yeah bye thank you thank you